we're lucky enough tonight uh, to have Elizabeth Rosner um, talking to us about her most recent novel, Blue Nude, um, which was published in 2006. She's received a great deal of acclaim not only for this book, but also for her poetry and her first novel called The Speed of Light. Um, Elizabeth has taught college level creative writing and composition for many years um, and is now a full time writer living in Berkeley, California. Um, her upbringing is Schenectady, New York, as a daughter of two Holocaust survivors, um, has clearly created a very complex identity which um, drives much of her writing. Um, both of her novels dealing with um, effects of World War II and the Holocaust. So um, we're very lucky to have her here tonight, um, Elizabeth Rosner. I need this? What do you think? It's in the room. room. Or I can just stand back here like this and project my voice. We'll do a little of both. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out on this uh, first night of November. And uh, I want to thank the World Studies program for sponsoring this event. And I want to thank my family, especially my brother Raphael and his wife Saint and the three kids who are hosting me here in Marlboro for a few days and uh, it's great to be here. I was realizing at dinner just now over in the dining hall that some significant moments in the creation of Blue Nude actually took place in Marlboro and one of the themes that recurs in Blue Nude is a very simple phrase, but a very significant phrase, and it's just two words long, begin again. And uh, that phrase came to me mystically from the middle of South Pond. I was swimming, and uh, I was feeling rather lost in my creative journey at the time, and uh, South Pond delivered the answer to me that got me started again and kept me moving through that novel. So um, Blue Nude is sort of, this, is, this is, gets to be sort of the Blue Nude birthplace now. I'll think of it that way. I had forgotten all about that. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit tonight about um, what I imagine is maybe the most relevant subject to the World Studies program, but also very close to my heart is the theme of reconciliation. And some of you know this about my past and some of you don't, but I'm going to give you a little biographical background to embellish upon what Irene offered up, which is that I grew up as the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And most of my life, from a very, very early age, even before the stories really became fully textured or fully detailed, I grew up knowing that my parents had lived through the horrors of World War II in Europe and that they were very lucky to have made it through and therefore I was very lucky to be alive, that had they not made it, I wouldn't be here. And that awareness grew, it, it widened, it deepened as I grew up and I began to realize that most of the questions I cared most about asking had to do with how my parents' experiences shaped who I became, what it was that I had inherited from them. And I, and I took that question of inheritance very seriously, it, almost as though it were from the DNA on up inside of me, that what I carried had been transmitted to me from them, verbally, non-verbally, biologically, etc. And it turned out that my parents had developed a circle of friends, even though they were in Schenectady, New York. A lot of European survivor immigrants had made their way to Schenectady, mostly because it was the home of General Electric. So there were a lot of engineers in my father's circle who had been hired by GE. 
And so it wasn't just in my immediate family, but in my extended community that I kept on hearing these stories about the Jewish experience during World War II and what it was like to be Jewish in America now. So in some ways, I felt like that was a very wide view of the world. It, it made me feel bigger than a lot of my American peers because I felt very connected to European history not just American history, and I felt that this made me sort of a bigger citizen of the world than most of the people I had grown up with who could maybe trace their families back several generations in America. There were people who had Mayflower ancestry, and I felt like, because I was a first-generation American, that I was almost more connected to Europe than I was to America. It wasn't until my late 20s, when I was living in California, that I feel my world widened even more. And that happened um, when I began to encounter other European Americans who carried the other side of the story that I had carried all of my life. And now I'm speaking specifically of Germans born after the war in Germany who had made their way to America. And even though when I was growing up, I knew my mother had always distinguished between German Jews and Germans, and my father was a German Jew, which made him the okay kind of German, it wasn't until I started meeting these German Germans, even though they had been born after the war, they were carrying what turned out to be the other side of my story the other side of the story that I thought I knew really well. Because I continually asked questions about it. I had written about it. I had studied it. I had researched it. And yet there was this huge piece of the story that somehow had evaded my investigations. And it turns out that that's not all that surprising. In some ways, on a, on a bigger scale than just my own, there's a lot of the German side of the story that hasn't been told. And I could elaborate on the reasons for that that have to do with our psyches and what we can handle, and I can use words like shadow material and denial and repression and all of these things, but what it really came down to in my experience was meeting face to face the descendants of my enemies seeing them as human beings. And so when I talk about conflict resolution and reconciliation, I, it sounds like a very grand and abstract concept, but in my experience, it turned out to be a very personal and very intimate relationship. Not because I fell in love with a German, as my mother had, although she fell in love with a German Jew, remember, but simply because I was in a room for the first time in my life with not only people like me, offspring of Holocaust survivors, but people who supposedly were my opposite, that is, people who had been born into Nazi families. Remember, they were born after the war just like I was, but they somehow carried in their DNA, in their cellular memory, in their psyches, the stories, whether they had heard them or not, the stories that their parents had lived through, and their grandparents. So we walk into this room together, knowing that this was going on. We weren't you know, blindsided by each other. This is a self-selecting group of Germans, I might add. They've already chosen to leave Germany and live in California, and now they're choosing to enter a workshop called the Acts of Reconciliation, which they know includes being face-to-face -face with people like me. So, a very courageous group, I think. So there we are in this room together, and one of the first things we're invited to do, and I should mention by name the person who created this project, his name is Armand Volkas. His parents were survivors of Auschwitz, and he was actually born in a displaced persons camp in France. So he was born even closer to the war than I was born in America. And he became a drama therapist. And just as a sidebar, this is a little bit of a humorous um, concept, but I, and I don't know if it's statistically verifiable, but I've been told 
that children of Holocaust survivors are overrepresented, vastly overrepresented in two groups, psychotherapy and the creative arts. Um, either because we're the clients of psychotherapists, or we have become therapists, or we're doing art. So here's Armand, who's managed to do both. He's taken on a dramatic arts therapy profession. And he has come up with this idea of bringing Germans and Jews together to do this project. And the first thing he asked us to do was to name ourselves, to introduce ourselves in the circle, and to say our first name, the first names of each of our parents, and then the simple statement, either I am a Jew or I am a German. So when it came my turn in the circle, I said, my name is Elizabeth. My father's name is Karl Heinz. My mother's name is Frida. And I paused, hearing the sounds of my parents' <laughs> names and how German they sounded. My mother was Polish born, but had this very Germanic name. And I thought, I wonder if people in the circle don't know what I'm going to say next, whether I'm going to say, I am a Jew or I am a German. And what I found myself saying was, I am a German Jew. Wow. And realizing in that moment how much my body actually held all of that story, including the German piece where my father had never allowed us to learn to speak German at home. We weren't allowed to study it in school. He wouldn't buy German products. He even began in some small ways to renounce his own German history by saying, for example, once in a while, we would have to fill out forms saying where our parents had been born. And my father would say sometimes, oh, just say Sweden. Because he had actually gone to Sweden as a refugee after surviving the concentration camp. And that's where he was educated. And that's where he met my mother. And so he said, just say Sweden. And I thought, it's as if he's trying to erase himself, you know. And it was, it was clear to me that he was so uncomfortable with his own Germanness that I had inherited that too, that sense of what is German in me or not. So here I am in this circle, and the project really began in that moment for me, that the reconciliation wasn't only outer. It wasn't only between the Jews and the Germans in this room, but it was within each of us. Because what the project also asked us to do, and in fact demanded that we do, is look inside of ourselves for not just the victim and not just the perpetrator, but both. Because the Germans had always been led to believe that they carried the perpetrator story. And the Jews had always been led to believe that we carried the victim story and that those worlds were completely and totally divided. And what I learned from that project and what I learned over and over again in my life experience is that the more we continue to exclude those categories from each other, that we identify solely with one place or solely with another place, we miss the opportunity to be healed within ourselves, to have that reconciliation take place in our own divided selves and psyches. And some of the stories I heard from these Germans were almost more heartbreaking than the stories I heard from my Jewish counterparts. And part of what was so painful about their stories was how untold they were, how unallowed these Germans were to have pain of their own. And some of the Jews in the room were people saying, you aren't allowed to show me your pain. You aren't allowed to tell me the story of how your village was bombed by the Allies. You know, your parents and grandparents murdered my entire family. You don't get to have suffering. You don't get to have your suffering acknowledged by me. And the process was extremely painful for everybody. We had to experience our shame, our anger, our blame, our closed-mindedness, our rejection of somebody else's legitimate life story. And not everybody got very far along that path, I have to say. And I'm not claiming to have been more righteous than anybody else. But I think partly because I felt that German Jewish split inside of me, I was even more attuned to what was it that I was having comfortable, having trouble owning. What, what couldn't I be comfortable with? And one of the scariest exercises Armand made us do was a role play in which we were paired up German and Jew, 
and we had to take turns doing something that he called master-slave. And the Jews didn't only get to be the slaves, right? The Jews had to take turns being the master. And this is hard for me to say in public, but I think it's an important thing to admit. When I was the master, and there was a German in front of me, I was just as brutal as, you know, sort of the horrible caricature of a Nazi. I mean, I, I had to let that be true about me. And the harshest thing I did was, it was a woman, and I told her she was not allowed to look at me. That she had to keep her eyes down. She was lower on the ground, I kept her down on the ground, and I told her she was not allowed to look at me. And what we talked about afterwards was the humiliation she felt by just saying that, that I told her that my status as master meant that I could deny her the humanness of being able to look me in the eye. And so I had to know what that felt like. I had to really allow myself to experience that before I could fully come to terms with what it was she was struggling to carry into her future the history that she had inherited from her parents. And that's separate from whatever violence or crimes her parents may have actually committed. This is just between her and me. And, and mind you, this couldn't have really been done between our parents, right? I mean, you can't ask Holocaust survivors to come into a room with prison camp guards and have them talk to each other in the way we were doing, right? You wouldn't do a role play with these people. But asking us to do it was so profound. And, and what it exemplified for me was a model of what's possible to heal any polarized pair of people, right? People who have been led to believe that the children of my enemy are my enemy too, and that once I hear your accent, I know who you are, and I know your story, and I don't need to hear anything else about you to know that you're bad or wrong or don't deserve to sit next to me. So it was excruciating and yet really necessary for each of us and for the Germans to know what it felt like to be subject to that, in the, to really experience it and not just hear the story of it. So um, with that being said, I want to read you just a little bit from Blue Nude, um, which in some ways this is the most ineffective introduction I could have given because when you read a novel, ideally you enter into the novel without having a whole philosophy behind it. You just open the page and you meet a character. And in the case of this novel, I want you to meet these characters as they meet each other. So I don't want to tell you too much about what actually happens in the novel, but there is a prologue which I'm not going to read to you and I'll tell you about that a little bit later, but I'm just going to start with a little bit of chapter one and a little bit of chapter two, and where you're going to be located, it will become clear to you, but we're in the San Francisco Art Institute, we're in a classroom, and um, we're we meeting two of the protagonists of the novel, a teacher named Danzig and a model named Marav. And first you're going to see Danzig's experience of seeing Marav for the first time, and then in chapter two, we'll see Marav experiencing her first encounter with Danzig. So, let's see if I can do this from here. Or do you want me back at the mic? Mic? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter one. Begin anywhere, Danzig says. The shoulder, the rib cage, the thigh, the ankle. It won't be an accident, even if it feels that way right now. He stands in his classroom at the Art Institute, the students arranged on chairs and stools in a rough circle with their sketch pads and charcoal, all 16 of them waiting for the model to take the first pose on her platform. Find a place where your line wants to take a journey, he says, some curve in any direction, a place where skin meets light meets shadow. Let your hand tell you. Begin there. He stands beside his faithful skeleton, the one that dangles like a marionette on its wooden stand, 
its bleached bones as familiar to him as an old friend. This is the invaluable prop he calls Dr. Memento for Memento Mori. Though Danzig is sure most of the students imagine he must be referring only to his own death and not theirs. They're so young, they are still convinced of their immortality. He is not allowed to touch the models. That's one of the rules of the Models Guild. And so, instead, Danzig will rest a hand on Dr. Memento's shoulder blade, tap a fingertip on his collarbone. Today, he casually holds the good doctor's left hand as a form of mild entertainment or even consolation. Later, he will gesticulate with its digits for emphasis, always reminding the students to keep track of the bones. Look closely, he tells the students, deeper. This is the predictable architecture of the body. This is how you pay attention to the truth. The model steps out from behind the screen and looks at him neutrally with apparent calm, though her gaze is aimed just past him, over his shoulder. She is lovely, he thinks, not beautiful in the usual boring ways. There is something else. He does his quick expert appraisal, dimensions, he thinks, that's what she has. Space between her features, her breasts, long arms and legs and torso, smooth unblemished skin, those very dark eyes, a full mouth even without a smile. Her fingers are long and tapered and she is completely unadorned. No makeup or jewelry or tattoos, just a pure unveiled being. He says what he always tells the models, that he wants her to start the session with 20 one-minute poses, and up she steps onto the platform. What he will remember later is that Billie Holiday was playing, that the light pouring through the high windows was diffuse and fog-colored, that as far as he could tell, none of the students truly realized just how good she was, from the moment of her first pose until the unraveling of the last one. He will remember pacing back and forth between the platform and his skeleton, taking its hand and dropping it, taking it back again. For the first time in all his years of teaching, he barely notices himself talking about bones, about the need to remind them what the body is made of, the mathematics of anatomy, the beauty underneath beauty. He can only see her. Chapter 2. Before taking her first pose, before stepping into her stillness, Marav is struck by the image of a man holding hands with a skeleton. It's a startling first impression, captured only in her peripheral vision, yet one she will not forget. But of course, this is a life drawing class. He is teaching the lessons she has heard so many times before, not only during modeling sessions, but in classes when she was a student herself, the proportional rules for hands and feet, the number of points where bones are visible under the skin, the practice of seeing the gestural line at the center of a pose. Now the instructor has dropped the skeleton's hand and left it swinging slightly. Walking toward the platform, he announces her first series of poses and Marav feels 16 pairs of eyes following the map he traces searching her body for corresponding clues. The students measure her, counting distances. They hold up their twigs of charcoal the way he has undoubtedly shown them, marking their way down the length and breadth of her body. At his cue, she turns like a dancer on a music box. She takes steps slow motion, in slow motion as if underwater. Marav's friend Lucy, the one who got her this job, told her she thought the teacher's name was Danzig. Lucy pronounced it as if she didn't know it was the old name of a now Polish city, and Marav didn't correct her. He came here from Austria, Lucy added. That's what everyone says. What else do you know about him, Marav asked. Well, he's famous from way back for some big, gloomy paintings, Lucy told her, and he's pretty abrasive. Most people actually consider him a son of a bitch, she said, laughing. 
I guess the best you can say is that he can be a little hard to take sometimes. Now that Marav is here in the room with him, she knows he's not Austrian, but German. It is unmistakable, that accent, she has no doubt. Having listened to accents all her life and known how to recognize the tongues of so many places, she trusts her ear. For those first several moments, she isn't sure she can manage to stay in the room. She's stunned by this almost primal response, her coiled readiness for flight. But of course, she stays. She steadies her heartbeat, calms herself down. She is experienced, a professional. She will do her work, and he will never know how the sound of his voice threatens to expose her far more deeply than she feels now in her nakedness. Still, her body finds its own way to speak. Later tonight, when she's falling asleep and reviewing her day, she will remember the way her body reacted to his voice. The poses she took in the first session were all in the shape of fear. A woman turning away from something threatening, a body in flight, the curled up shape of self-defense protecting the heart, the belly. She said nothing, but her body spoke its own language. Sit. <laughs> to you. Um, so I was skipping around a little bit just to keep that short, but um, we were talking at dinner about um, the concept of embodiment, of, of embodying knowledge. And uh, to me, they're actually both working in their own ways with that very concept, that Marav's body is speaking her response to the sound of the German voice and Danzig's relationship with this skeleton and how he's using it to teach, but what he's thinking about as he's teaching is also his relationship, not just to the body, but actually to the whole skeletal system. And as you read the book, you find out where his original relationship with a skeleton and with death actually gets traced to. Um, the other thing I want to say about this book is that the shape of the book is important for you to know, too. It, that beginning, although I said I'll tell you about the prologue in a minute, that beginning is the section of the book called The Present. And it moves back and forth through this encounter between Danzig, the German painter, and Marav, the Israeli model, um, until by the end of her posing for his class, we find out that Danzig is a blocked painter who could teach but not create. And he sees in Marav the hope of his own rediscovered creative juice. By the end of that day, he asks Marav if she'll pose for him privately, and Marav, we've heard her response to him, does everything she can to avoid answering the invitation. The book um, then winds back into the middle section, which is called The Past, and we get chapters of Danzig's childhood, Marav's childhood, she grew up on a kibbutz, he grew up in Berlin after the war. And we also get introduced to Danzig's older sister, who not only grew up in Berlin, but was actually in the Hitler Youth during the war. And after that section is completed, and we find out a lot more about how Danzig and Marav have come to be the people that they are in the present, we return to the present. And this is the part I won't give away. <laughs> what happens between the two of them when they um, meet again is, is art really possible between them? And so my message in the book, as is my message of the evening really, is um, what is possible between two strangers? Especially when those two strangers carry within them big stories, big historical stories about their obligation to hold a certain belief system about who's safe and who isn't, or who deserves forgiveness, or who deserves to be reconcilable and not. And in my belief system and in what I've learned from people like Armand and, and from my own experience as a writer, it's, it's creativity that gets us there. It's the making of art. It's, it's opening to what's possible, what hasn't been made before. 
that enables that kind of human connection. It's looking each other in the eye. It's speaking the truth to one another. It's a very human experience. And Armand has been applying his practices to other polarized groups throughout the world. He's traveled to Germany and done the work in Germany, not just in America, with Germans in Germany. He's worked with Palestinians and Israelis. He's worked with blacks and Jews. He's tried to carry the message bigger and wider to other groups and other places in the world. And my hope with this book is that as far as my book can travel and, and bring that message to one reader at a time, it's also that mission or that purpose for me, is to teach people that it is actually possible to honor your history, not to erase it, not to wipe it out, but to carry it into an encounter with another person and meet in that place where you accept all the vulnerabilities that go with being alive, you know, that we each do carry that perpetrator victim potential. We each do carry our shadow material and what we choose to do with that is what makes us human beings and what makes us creative beings, I think. So um, I want to open, open the floor to you and to um, make this more of a conversation if you have comments or questions, I'd be delighted. And, uh, and the last thing I'll say, because I promised I would say where the prologue comes from. When the book was getting ready for publication, my editor um, said um, how much he loved the book, of course, but he had this question. The first two words of the book were, begin anywhere. You heard me read them, chapter one, begin anywhere. And he said, if you, really, if you really believe that you can begin anywhere, would you consider beginning somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't in love with chapter one as the beginning of the book. And so um, I had to sort of put my money where my mouth was with that one. Yeah. OK, begin anywhere. Where else might I begin? And begin again. So I told him I would try. And I wrote a prologue. And the prologue is actually um, in some ways the most disembodied part of the book because it's an encounter between an unnamed, unidentified soldier and an unnamed, unidentified young woman in a timeless time and a placeless place where he points a gun at her and puts the gun down. That he's been told she's his enemy, but when he sees her, he can't shoot her. And that's just a five-page scene, and then the book begins, we begin anywhere. And so um, I did have to begin somewhere else, but I got to have it my way, too, because chapter one is still chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> begin anywhere. But, um, but so you can see that theme of, um, you know, what does war ask of us, and what's an alternative to war, is, is the question I keep asking. And that begin again also applies to that, what if what if we start over in the peacemaking process? What would that look like? So, um, thank you so much for being here. I would love to hear questions or comments. Yeah, I do have a question. It's so interesting because I listened just a week ago or something to Naomi Tutu, mm -hmm. who is the daughter of Desmond uh -huh. Tutu, mm -hmm. and you said in your introduction, of course, Holocaust survivors cannot meet uh, perpetrators. But she so strongly talked about how important it is to claim it all yeah. and to really encounter that pain. And so I was just wondering, you were so, so, so sure. But I, it yeah. came back to me right away with the Truth and Reconciliation so, uh, Commission. Yeah. And so I was just it's so interesting. I must have felt you in the room thinking that because when I, when I heard myself saying that, which I do say, um, I also thought, Oh, but there's this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and, and there are, um, actually San Quentin is a, a maximum security prison not far from where I live in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they are bringing together um, incarcerated men with victims to, I forget what they're calling them, there's a restorative name. justice. Restorative justice, yeah. thank you. They do that here in Vermont. Oh, they have a very okay. uh, strong system here. So okay. these, these are extraordinary situations, I think, where people in present time, within 
the same lifetime are able to face one another and tell their stories. And South Africa is, is the most exquisite example of that. I mean, really, it was invented there, I think, as far as I know. The Truth and Reconciliation. Well, yes, there were also stuff in, in South America. Mm -hmm. How she talked about it, that, uh, yeah, South America. Well, she would know, yeah. But so I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it is, I, I really shouldn't be that emphatic when I say that. It's just, I speak, I think, from a personal place of not being able to imagine my parents in a room with um, people of their generation who were actually perpetrators. But maybe I shouldn't speak for them. You know, maybe I shouldn't. I know that my father, my father, who's still alive, thank God, um, does say that Germans of younger generations he doesn't have any trouble with. But it's very, very difficult for him to even converse with a German of his own generation, even now, because he's so haunted by where were you that you know when I was in concentration camp, what were you doing? And um, so where where was he? He was in Buchenwald. Yeah. But he was in Hamburg until quite late. That's where he's from originally. And he was deported to concentration camp in 1944 and was liberated in 1945. So did you ever go to Auschwitz or Buchenwald? I, I went to Buchenwald with my father, yeah. Mm -hmm. Twice, actually, yeah. But I haven't been to Auschwitz. Yeah. I'm from Denmark, and I go on I'm in the Second World War. Just a little girl, mm -hmm. and my father was a freedom fighter. And the only thing we knew about the concentration camps were what we could hear on BBC. Mm -hmm. Didn't speak English, but we could understand what was going on. And it took us a long time to be able to even accept anything German mm -hmm. in Denmark. The, Den the Danish people were, we couldn't fight very much, but we certainly helped. Uh, the Jewish people to get them to Sweden. Yeah. And uh, of course, it, I'll never forget, you know, as a little kid, I grew up having that thing about the Germans. Today I don't have a problem, I love everybody, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. at that time it was rough. Yeah. Well, the Danish story, I mean, I shouldn't say this for you, you can tell the story better than I, I'm sure, but the but the Danes are held as this shining example of an entire nation who resisted. It wasn't just there was resistance in Denmark. I mean, the entire country of Denmark is held up as exemplifying what was possible if, if the human spirit was, was courageous enough. And my understanding is that the king, when asked to um, turn over his Jews or to force the Jews of Denmark to wear identification like the yellow star, the king of Denmark said, we are all Jews here, or something like that. I mean, is that a true story? Everybody. 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 Ever
the way you use your language to convey all the technical side of music and, and opera in Spirit of Light and painting here, um, is it, is, does it have something to do with the fact that you've done a lot of poetry and, mm -hmm. and you know how to uh, embody a technical experience with a kind of inwardness? Uh, I'm really very impressed by the way you use music in the in Spirit of Light and painting here. Thank you. Well, I can say um, that I do this odd form of research, which um, is anything but scholarly, and, and somebody actually called it um, method writing, like instead of method acting, <laughs> which I thought was a great term and I want to steal it now. But um, So method writing for me is that I, um, when I was writing Speed of Light, I took voice lessons because I really wanted to know what was happening in that embodiment kind of way? What exactly is happening when you're training your voice? And the woman that I studied with, I only took five lessons. Um, she was not only a wonderful teacher of operatic voice, but she also was really interested in the psychology of singing. So she really helped me understand not just the technique of, of, of sound, but what is it that you have to do to get out of the way of the things that are going to stop your voice? Which is what I was very interested in for that book especially, because the, the singer in that book actually loses her voice and has to regain it. And when I was working on the Nude, I had modeled as a young woman when I was in college, and, um, and that was my initial experience of being fascinated with the relationship between artists and their muses or what their inspiration was. So when I was working on Blue Nude, I modeled again and I painted and I interviewed painters and I interviewed models and, you know, it's very compelling to me to climb all the way inside of these, not just my characters, but people who really are in the world doing these things. and. I, I sometimes trace it back to my childhood when people ask me, did you always want to be a writer? I usually say, I always wanted to be everything. Um, um, I wanted to be a painter, and I wanted to be a dancer, and I wanted to be a singer, and I wanted to be an actor. And, and so this is my chance now to live all these vicarious lives. And so I get to, um, you know, for five lessons, be a singer. And I get to be a painter for two weeks. And I, you know, and... Um, and really try and know from the inside out. So I, I appreciate you saying that that, that, it, that it reads that way on the page. So thank you, Patricia. It's nice to see you. Yes? I'm very conscious of the fact that not everyone's read the book, and I don't want to. <laughs> and I'm, OK, spoiler alert. I'm going <laughs> to <I'm, I'm laughs> try not to. I'm 80% through. Um, but I'm really thinking so much about Margot, the older sister of dancing, and the way her story um, is grad gradually comes across because, you know, what you the little, the little what you understand about the father, you you feel like there must be abuse, and then you know it really shocked me to realize how that, uh, how going through that experience, she was you know, one of the most um, interesting characters in terms of broadening my understanding. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. She was the most difficult character for me to write in the book. And I was speaking at dinner, um, I think maybe more freely because everyone in the room had read the book, but um, she, her story comes out of a story that I heard from these German participants in the project. Not her exact story as it is in the book, but a story like it that so moved me that I wrote her that way. And it was the story told by a German woman about her mother having been in the Hitler Youth and having been touched by Hitler. And the woman who told the story, who hadn't even been born at the time, said, all of my life I felt dirty because Hitler touched my mother and therefore touched me. And that was one of those, you know, I was forever changed by hearing her say that, that that was what 
a German of my generation was living with. And, uh, and that ultimately led to my writing the story of Margaret, although there's another piece of the Margaret story which is um, a bit stranger maybe and more sort of metaphysical, but I, um, I did a session with a woman who led me through a past life regression. And uh, I always say this sounds very California when I tell this story, but this happened in New York State. <laughs> so, um, and her name was Mary Brown. And uh, I actually went to her through the recommendation of a friend not long after my mother had passed away. And my father came along. And, uh, and she said that um, she believed that she herself um, had reincarnated after having been killed in the Holocaust. And that one of her children once came home from school saying that a Holocaust survivor had come to his fourth grade classroom and that when she talked about the gas chambers, he knew what she was talking about because he remembered being there. So she had some very amazing experiences, not even knowing that my father himself was a survivor when she was saying all of this. So, she led me through this sort of meditation practice. It, it, it wasn't exactly like hypnosis because I was very present and she was just asking me questions about what year is it, how old are you, are you a girl or a boy, you know, she just led me through this and, and I answered her questions as if she were just interviewing me and I was, these things were just coming out of my mouth, but uh, you know, it was Berlin, it was 1941, my, I was living with my grandparents because my parents had been killed in a car accident. I mean, I was just saying these things, didn't know where they came from. And, um, and at the end of that story, which was a very tragic story about somebody, oh, this, I, this woman died very young, and, um, and at the end of the experience with her, I said to her, how do, how do you know, how do I know I didn't just write that? I'm a writer, maybe I just made that character up and told her life story just now. And she said, well, there's no way to know, but, um, but maybe your writing will be impacted in some way by this. And so I came back to California, and I wrote these pages about Margot, and they frightened me. I mean, I was writing in the, in the psyche and experience of a young girl in the Hitler youth. And I got very disturbed, and I put the pages away, and I write longhand, and I put the pages away, and a year later, I was talking on the phone with my editor about Blue Nude, and I was apologizing for how short the book was. And I kept on saying, is it okay if it's a novella when I turn it in instead of a novel, because it's fair, I can't seem to make it any longer. And he said, well, there's something missing. There's some pivotal piece that's missing. And I had my laptop open on my desk, and all of a sudden I saw a folder, and it said Margot. And I opened up the folder, and there were these chapters, these two chapters, that I had typed into the computer. I have no memory of typing that. And I said, um, OK, I think I have something to send you, actually. And I sent these pages to him, and he said, you forgot you wrote these? <laughs> Are you on drugs or something? You know, he was just stunned, and he said, this is what I was talking about, being missing. And of course, she is not just the blue nude of the novel, but she's, you know, she really is the pivot of the novel. And as you say, it's, you know, very, very important to our understanding of what this is all about. So, anyway, that's the full story of, of where Margaret comes from. So, and now I'm probably giving it all away. <laughs> Yes. About, one of the things that I, I'm struggling with in my life currently is really feeling this, um, feeling safe enough to, to check in with my feelings sometimes or all the time in this culture. And um, I feel compelled to be you know, a strong male, unfeeling guy. And you know, I, I wonder there's a certain safety in, in writing or or maybe like allowing yourself to feel those feelings, you know, whether it's in the in the um, psychodrama stuff mm -hmm. or the writing. How how difficult is it for you to tap into how you're feeling about 
does in this stuff? Is, is there something kind of like say, safety in the writing where you can really let go? You know, sometimes there's safety and sometimes there's the opposite. I mean, sometimes it gives me so much access to an emotional state that, like I said, when I was writing those Marva sections, it becomes frightening. I mean, it's sort of, it's like sort of the, the bottom falling away if you drop in fully. And, and the writing, I think to be true as to the writing, you can't be in control. So to say, oh, I'll be safe, I'll just tiptoe into this stay, I think sometimes the writing requires of me that I be even less in control than in the rest of my life. So at the same time I say that, I can also say that there is this certain way in which, okay, I'm just taking a piece of it at a time. I'm not taking my, I'm, I'm not writing memoir, you know. I'm taking a character and exploring this part of my psyche by way of this character, so maybe that's the safe piece of it. I'm, I'm compartmentalizing it in that way. But it's a very good question. I think that um, sometimes when I feel unable to write, it may be because I'm, I'm afraid of how much I'm going to feel if I, if I truly enter the mode of my characters. And even though I think it's probably strange to admit this, there are times when I read my own work and cry. I mean, that I, I actually re-experience the pain of having written something dark again when I read it. So um, it just happens to be true for me that I think that's how I know I'm alive too. You know that that I think it, getting back to that maybe strange story I just told about doing that past life regression at the end of the story when I died or when this woman died. At first, I was sobbing. She said, what's happening? And I said, they're hanging me. I, I was being hung. And then I stopped crying very suddenly. And she said, now what's happening? And I said, I'm flying across the ocean. And she said, um, OK, where are you now? And I said, oh, I'm being born into me now. And. Uh, and then she said, and this is what she does at the end of each one of these sessions with people, she says, what were you supposed to learn? What did you learn from that lifetime? What did you bring into this lifetime? And I said, it was a very short and very numb life. And what I learned is to bring to this life a wish to feel everything. And um, so that's what I asked for, I guess this time around, you know. Um, so the writing actually is a way that I do that. Um, and I hope it also teaches me how to, you know, do it in, the, in, you know, the rest of my life too. But it was clearly something, if you believe in that kind of thing, if you believe in some kind of soul journey or a way that we um, make choices about our incarnations, that some part of me chose to be in a life where I would feel everything. So, yeah. I personally have a very difficult time with past life experiences because I often think, you know, there's so much pain around everywhere. And if you think about the Holocaust experiences, the pain is just there. So why do you have to go into the bed, into, yeah. into the past? Sure. No, I appreciate you saying that. I do. I think that um, it, all I can say is it's the only experience I've ever had doing that. And it was, it wasn't anyone leading me somewhere I didn't want to go. I went to see her because I, I wanted to know. And, and I write but, because and I want to know. Was it your pain you feel yourself still from the family? You know, that, because that was, that's my experience mm -hmm. with, uh, not clearly in German, yeah. but having these experiences, it's the commonality of pain. Mm -hmm. It is the variations of pain, which is not just unique to Germans yeah. and Jews, yeah. which is not just unique to South Africa. It is unique also in our neighborhoods. It's also, you know, there are, that pain is there. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. The, it is the human condition. It is, it is the human yes. condition. Yes. And, uh, and yet for me... And for me, you, that is yes. distancing yes. then, going into the past. And I'm not criticizing. I'm no, just trying, I, to, trying yeah. to understand it. For me, it's connective. For me, being able to name pain using, I mean, what, what Birger so kindly called my poetic language, I mean, finding the words to really say what that pain is, is a healing process for me. It is. That doesn't mean it isn't painful also. It has its own quality of pain. But ultimately, I believe, I believe it's redemptive. I do. Yeah. I really want to read your book now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I have no idea what I'm going to say and what I want to talk about because I just have so many parallels in our lives. Um, I, I never know whether to call my father a survivor or not because he wasn't in a concentration camp. He was held by the Nazis for five months in Vienna and mysteriously released. Um, and, you know, went to Yugoslavia and tried to get his whole family to leave, and they wouldn't. Um, so he left, and they stayed, and they all died in Auschwitz. So I feel like I'm the, the granddaughter of people who, who did die. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess just one thing that I want to say is that it was very hard as a little girl to have no place to go with my grief about my grandparents. And it never, of course, occurred to me that I needed that. And then when I was an adult, I started um, dancing to Verdi's Requiem. And I danced and cried and cried and danced for about seven years. Um, and that was a tremendous gift to me. And then after those seven years, when I started, stopped crying and I would do the dance for other people, then they would cry. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like your book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wow, well, thank you. I want to say something about that word survivor, if I may, mm -hmm. um, because uh, I've been learning something new about that recently. Um, I, too, always wondered how those definitions or hierarchies or whatever were <laughs> established and by whom. My father was in concentration camp, my mother was in hiding, you know, um, and my father was never comfortable referring to himself, still is not comfortable referring to himself as a Holocaust survivor because he doesn't like the word survivor. Mm. And what he says about it is, um, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, um, I'm no better than anyone who didn't survive, so I don't like to give myself some kind of special credit for having been smarter or more, you know, careful or whatever. He doesn't like to elevate himself in some way above those who didn't survive, and so what he usually says is, I was in concentration camp with his German accent, you know, he says that, and then, um, Last year I had breast cancer, and um, I got through breast cancer treatment, and um, I am now being asked if I'm a breast cancer survivor. And I discover, much to my astonishment, that I'm very uncomfortable with this word survivor. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother had breast cancer and died. And I didn't die yet. Um, so I find myself understanding my father's use of that, not wanting to use that word in a, in a completely new way suddenly. And so I think, you know, my love of words and my fascination with words gets to take on all of these dimensions and sort of fragmentations. The more I live, the more I understand what all of this means and the idea that you could dance to a piece of music for seven years is amazing to me. And then what that enables you to give clearly is exquisitely important. Yeah. <laughs>